are moving today to the formation of the New Testament canon. We looked at the Old Testament canon last week. By the way, that picture right there is a picture of our oldest book of the New Testament. We'll get to that in a little bit. But let's do another pop quiz just for fun, just to get your uh, brain synapses working. Uh, the first one, it took almost 400 years for the church to officially, formally adopt the books of the New Testament as canonical. How many people would say true? And there's no shame either way. How many would say true? Okay. Now, and how about falsers? Come on, falsers. No? Most people are more confident with true. You're correct. That's about three uh, 90s right in there when the church at the Council of Carthage um, formally adopted the canon. Um, until the final decision was made for the New Testament books, there were many other books that were just as highly esteemed as the ones now in our New Testament. It's getting a little more tricky now. How many people want to say yes to that? We got some yesers. Fal false folks? False? Come on, be proud. Be bold. Be proud. It's all right. So, you know, this one's a little bit of a trick question, but I'm going to say this is false. There were definitely other books but none that were highly as esteemed as the ones in the New Testament. Ah, so, so I definitely threw you a curveball on that one. Okay, the oldest piece of papyrus we have of a New Testament book dates to the early 2nd century. That means like between 100 and 150 uh, AD. Is that true or false? Do we have something that young or old? Smallest uh, little piece of papyrus. True or clearly true. true. Clearly true. No question. Tim is on that one. False. Absolutely. Anybody? We got a few. Sure. Sure. Go for it. Ah, it's true. No. It is true. It's called the Ryland fragment, and it's dated between 100 and 150, and it's a tiny little piece of papyrus from the eighth chapter of John. So. Um, then uh, this one, the Emperor Constantine called all the churches together at the Council of Nicaea to decide the New Testament canon. True. People true? Okay, we got quite a few truers. It's all right, people. False? Tim is bold again, and Tim is right again. It is not the Council of Nicaea. In fact, I just tipped your hat on that. It was the Council of Carthage. Um, so uh, Nicaea was about something else. But we're going to have fun with that tonight, today. Uh, there were many Gospels beside the four in our Bible that competed to get into the canon. Now, this is another little tricky one. Many Gospels besides our four that competed to get into the canon. True or false? And some of these you could argue either way. But anyway, so truers? Right. Truers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. False? False? Oh, man, Tim is on a roll. It, I'm going to say this is false. Um, again, it's a trick question because there are many Gospels beside that competed to get into the canon. The only other Gospel that was even mentioned when it came to the, what was going to get in was a Gospel called the Gospel of the Hebrews. Um, there weren't many. We've discovered many Gospels now um, from in the place called Nag Hammadi, Egypt. We had heard about a lot of Gospels. They were just alluded to by some of the church fathers. We'd never had them. We didn't know what the Gospel of Thomas, or the Gospel of Peter, or the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, or the Gospel of Judas, or many of these other Gospels that we've heard about now. We had, we had heard people talk about them, never seen them. They're never mentioned as even a potential of getting into the camp. Never even um, a part of the conversation. They obviously were referred to, or so that's why it's a little bit. Yes, there were many other Gospels, but no. False. They, did, they weren't really competing to get into the canon. Okay, so I'm talking about canon. What is a canon? Um, it's the authority, it means authoritative. That's the bottom line. It actually comes from the Greek word rule or ruler, measuring stick. That's what can, so the canon is a measuring stick. We believe that canon was formed and given to us. Not only was the writing of the scripture uh, itself. Uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but that the Holy Spirit guided the formation of the canon. But before we even go any further than this, I want you to engage just for a few minutes. Why do you think it is important to have a set list of books 
that are authoritative or the standard? Are there downsides to having a candy? Why is it important? Talk amongst your table. Talk amongst your row back there. Just turn towards each. Don't form a circle back there yet. That'll happen later. So just turn to the person next to you or the people in your row if you're in the back or if you're at the table. Turn um, and you don't have to input anything, but if you have any thoughts, share them at your table or in your row. Why is it important to have a standard? You got two minutes. Ready? Go. So having something written down, we don't just have the corporate drift. Um, and yes, you're right that in more ancient times and in a different culture than ours that was totally oral culture, verbal tradition driven, they were very accurate with that. Absolutely. I saw one. Okay, yeah. I was going to say the same thing because we need something tangible to be able to refer okay. to yes. and also um, the compilation uh, kind of um, <coughs> the witnesses yes. that agree with the stories that was told. Okay, okay, Go good. back and forth. Right. And then what do you do if you have all these diverge, really divergent viewpoints on, yeah, okay. Yeah, comes, there, yeah please. It comes down to, if there's not a truth with a capital T, yes. then there's everybody's little truths. Yes, okay, that goes back to that postmodernism thing. Um, and yes, very good. And then, yes, Billy Jean, and then Doug, and then we'll, we'll launch in. Yeah. Well, at our table, we were thinking, you know, people are like herding cats. Yes. And so they needed some way to get a common yes. thread, a common goal, so right. they can move them down the road together, yep. worshiping God. Yep. The whole thing was to believe in Christ and worship God. And the Bible, throughout the whole Bible, it is about God. It gives us His character, His promises, right. His right. laws, but it's really a threefold, which I just said and thought yep. was really interesting, it's a threefold Christ reminder. It's like, yes. I'm going to bring you somebody, the somebody's here, and guess what? That somebody's coming back again, and that's Jesus okay. Christ. And it's Tell us the story. Funnel it together. Okay, excellent, excellent. Up here to Doug, and then Jim, and then we'll, then we'll, then you can sit down, and then I'll talk. Yeah? We didn't get a chance to mention it in our little group discussion, but I think it's really important. Well, the, the Timothy passage that yeah. that she read uh, certainly points it out as God breathed. That yeah. means, and we certainly believe that the Holy Spirit inspired all of Scripture. Yeah. So, if the Holy Spirit inspired it, then God definitely meant us to have that Scripture to live and grow our faith by. Mm -hmm. So, it's certainly important that we yeah. keep that collection of books that we that the Holy Spirit told us right. was, was determined to be in our Bible. Okay, excellent. Uh, yeah. yes. I, uh, my question is, uh, after hearing Pastor Paul today, with yes. all the Greek words, yes. his meaning, the Hebrew, yeah, the Hebrew, the Hebrew words, words. Yeah. Um, what about all these different, humongous different versions of standard Bible we have today, yes. the King James, and the right, Bible, right, with all the different Interpretations of all these different yes. words. Yeah. How does that reconcile with having a set list? Of books? Yeah. So we've got a set list of Greek and Hebrew books, but then we've got all these translations. And is that that's a great question? I didn't really anticipate talking about that. Today. <laughs> no, it's a great question. I'm going to hit it really quick, and then something actually that will probably come up on some of our future topics. But I can say this much, that it used to be the King James was considered almost the divinely inspired translation from the Greek into the English. Just like the Septuagint, like we talked about last week, the Greek translation of the Old Testament was considered by many to be a divinely inspired, you know, translation. So in the time of Jesus, you've got a Greek translation of the... Old Testament and the Hebrew. And there were books in the Greek that were not in the Hebrew, but those kind of walked alongside each other, and people had different feelings about those, just like we have different English translations today. So I will say this, though. Um, given we have a canon of Greek manuscripts that everybody starts from, I think you can have a lot of dependability in whatever English 
translation you well, I don't want to say whatever, but the, 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 the primary ones, the NIV, the New Revised Standard, the Revised Standard, the New King James Version is certainly uh, helpful. The Catholics have the Jerusalem Bible. Uh, these are all Bibles that scholars have tried to be accurate to the original languages and put it in. So I always encourage people to buy one of those Bibles that put four translations next to each other if you really want to get into it because then you can see, oh, this verse, they're exactly the same. And then you come to one that's a little different and you go, oh, that must be a little bit of a challenge translating here. So that's a great additional question. Yeah. Very good, very good. All right, well, I wanted you to get wrestling with this importance. One thing that comes up, Doug, off of your comment a little bit is... So probably with the canon, the New Testament canon, we believe that's inspired by the Holy Spirit in a way that maybe, um, who's your favorite Christian author today? Throw one out. Lucado. Lucado, Max Lucado. Is he not led by the Holy Spirit? Okay. Well, yes, we would say he is, but he's not the canon. He's judged by what he says about the New Testament canon. So we don't want to fall into the error that the Holy Spirit flew up into heaven completely. Uh, because God's Spirit continues to inspire people and direct people, preachers who preach, but it's a little bit different with the canon. So, but, but I'm just going to let that sit there and have you think about it. So, yes, you've talked about all of these reasons uh, and uh, that we need a canon um, and that we have a canon. Um, and the question is, is it a dependable witness? Is our New Testament a dependable witness? Um, I talked about criteria last week. I'm going to give you some, the criteria again that I think comes up when it comes to how did the New Testament get formed. I'm just going to front load this and then we'll come back to it. Uh, member Pact, P-A-C-T. So P, the first one, is popularity. For instance, the second Peter, you know, your first and second Peter. Second Peter was a very popular book. But many people didn't think it should be in the canon because they weren't sure it was authentically from Peter. Um, so so, a, so it could be popular, but it might have been rejected because it wasn't authentic or connected to the apostle or maybe someone close to the apostle. What's the content? That people didn't have any problem with the content of 2 Peter, uh, for instance, as one book. Um, but uh, so, And then time, the use it kind of goes back to popularity, so it usually happens over time. Uh, what do we mean by inspiration? Yeah, I want to come back to this slide. Um, what I said last week about how the, can the Old Testament canon was formed, I'm going to reiterate, reiterate for the New Testament. There are some folks that want us to kind of believe that the New Testament kind of directly, God wrote it and dropped it down. There should be a Bible here and not whatever that is. But, uh, um, uh, uh, and just dropped it into our hands so there was no human contact at all. Uh, that's not the way it happened. Although sometimes Sunday school kids think that. And then when they find out it's not, sometimes that's a crisis of faith for them. Maybe it's a crisis of faith for you too. So the New Testament didn't wake up one day and say, oh goody, I'm the authority. <laughs> it didn't happen overnight, okay? But then, and so how is the, it, but is it the truth? Is how did it happen? Um, and then I said the other side that we can fall off is this kind of, the, the canon was decided by a few people in a smoky filled room, okay? Um, and that powerful people suppress the truth. How many of you seen the movie Da Vinci Code? How many of you read the book? All right, good. It's the most believable book that's filled with total lies and mysteries. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I went like, oh my gosh, that's right. Oh my. And then I look into it and almost 90% isn't true. One of the things, well, let's actually take a look at a little, uh, a little, little, um, and we, so Bob, if you're ready at the lights, um, this is a little excerpt where the two main characters in the Da Vinci Code are trying to figure out what this grail is, and they're talking to this, you know, professor about uh, discovering that that the grail is really Mary Magdalene and and the, the, um, the lineage of of her womb. Um, 
But anyway, so this is the conversation at dinner table that's put forth as the truth about how the Bible came to be. I hope you can hear it. The Bible has been a first time that was on that. But you can have Constantine said, let's get this one, let's get this one, and 
Now, is that the way it really happened? And I want to say that it didn't. So you could fall off on either side of believing it came down like a parachute or believing it was done by Constantine or some other folks in a smoky, you know, room. It, it was multi-layered, it took a long time, and it was complex. But I'm going to help you get at it. All right? But first, let's actually look at the Bible and look at a few passages that I think are interesting, not totally focused on the, ca the canon, but interesting to help us see how this came about. Paul says in Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received. Now that goes to Tim's comment earlier about oral tradition, but who knows whether that was oral or written tradition. Paul speaking 20 years after Christ died, in the 50s, maybe early 60s. Um, so he says, I'm, I didn't invent this gospel. In another place he'll say, Christ gave it to me directly. But here he says, I'm handing on to you what was handed on to me. So already there's a tradition of a core of what the faith is. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's do another one. The next passage, Paul is talking in Galatians, and he's pretty upset because some other people are preaching a different gospel, which is always why I get concerned when I hear maybe a different gospel being preached. Um, he says, um, but even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, let that one be accursed. Um, so, this Paul is taking a lot of authority, saying we have given you the gospel. It was passed on to us, but Paul also in some of his letters will say that it's almost like he got this directly from Christ. Um, so, and then remember, Paul writes before our four Gospels are written. But at any rate, did you know that there's some sayings of Jesus that were out there that are not in our four Gospels? One way we know this is right here in the book of Acts. You see here. Um, in all of this I have given you an example that such a work we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, for he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Did your mom or dad bring you up telling you that? Did you know that's not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? It's in the book of Acts. So there's a saying here of Jesus that's not in the book of Acts. By Early on, we're very confident that Jesus' sayings were being written down and that behind Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were very likely some written sources as well as oral sources. So I'm putting this to you just to help you see that, that the progression of how things start to go. John says something really fascinating in the end of the Gospel of John. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the book that would be written. So do we have everything Jesus said? Probably not. Um, this is a pretty amazingly bold statement there. So, so those I just find are interesting passages. There's another one from that disputed book, which you'll hear more about in just a minute. Uh, this is from 2 Peter, talking about Paul. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, speaking of this as he does in all his letters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. I just love that. How many of you have come to me and said, Paul is so heavy, so hard to understand. Well, the writer of 2 Peter thought so too. Early on, in other words, what the reason I show you this is early on, while the New Testament is being written, people are already reading Paul's letters. In my view, they're already authoritative. They're already something Christians are looking to. In the beginning, Christians looked to the Old Testament most of the time.
time the Greek New Test Old Testament as their scripture. But now they understand the concept, and now they're starting to look to some of the other writings as authoritative. So, so that's just a few interesting biblical passages. Let's look at some external references, and let's do this by using a little tool that I have. Um, there it is. Okay. So this is a cool tool, and I know it's a little bit hard so, to read at this size, but um, this shows any place where books of the Bible are mentioned in documents. And what books are mentioned as authoritative? The, so, but I want to read, show you something right at the top over here. This tool shows that as various people on the left, or documents, because we also will go down here and we'll see various um, manuscripts, and then um, here we have different things from different people um, in the early church, in the first two, three hundred years of the church. Um, so we, we see the books here, but they didn't just say there's holy book, the, 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 you know, the authoritative books and the non-authoritative books. No, they had categories for stuff in between them. So let me uh, press this button here. Uh, so there, they Proto-canon is what the word they use. These are public services that re they read like we do on Sunday morning, and they were viewed as the basis for doctrine. There were deuterocanonical books that were used in public services. They were read when Christians gathered, but they weren't looked to for doctrine. There was tritocanonical books, works that are good for reading, but not used in the service or for doctrine. Martin Luther would say that the Apocrypha, those books that are in the Greek Old Testament, not in the Hebrew, are trito canon. They're good for reading, but they're, they, they're not to be put on the same level. And then there were other additional material, and then there were stuff that were questioned and debated, and then there were books that were absolutely rejected as not even, shouldn't even be a part of the conversation. So let's start here. Um, let's see. I want to go down here to manuscripts. So, where's my, here, yeah. So I want to go to this Mertorian fragment, or canon, and this people date to about 200 AD. All right, so just think of this. If we think about Jesus dying around in the early 30s, Paul writing in the, early, in the 50s and 60s, and then the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and maybe the 70s, John maybe a little later. Um, we've got that little fragment of John about 120 A.D. Well, the Mertorian fragment is over here about 200 years, about 150 years after Jesus walked the earth. So, it's, it's a list of books. How cool. We have a list. The Da Vinci Code writer says that, you know, Constantine kind of made it up, but already in 200 AD, there's a list of books. What were they? Well, didn't include all of the New Testament. It had these books. It didn't have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and Acts. It had the letters of, these letters of Paul. Um, and all, pretty much the 11 letters of Paul were in almost all of the lists of, canon, of the canon. Um, we've got these letters listed, and then the wisdom of Solomon, which um, or is not in our current New Testament. Um, we've got Revelation there, and then a book called the Apocalypse of Peter, and then it talks about the Epistle to the Laodiceans, Epistle to Alexandrians, Psalm of Marcion, Psalms of Marcion, I'll talk about him in a minute, this book called Shepherd of Hermas was one that people thought was really cool, but Again, it didn't go back to the apostles, so they weren't too sure about it. So the point here is that in 200 AD, we have a list that includes a lot of our New Testament. Okay? That's not too, too difficult, I don't think. Um, let's see. Before we get to these codexes, um, the Syriac Bible, um, it, it's an Old Testament. I think this is the Old Testament one. And... Um, 
37 AD or so. And so, so we see that the Greek Old Testament is pretty well set, but that's not the one I wanted. We got the rhetoric, I wanted to go to Origen. That's the guy. So Origen lived in 253 AD. He's a church leader. I'm not going to give you a history lesson on Origen, because I can see some of your eyes fogging over. Um, this is a list that he has. Interesting. Old Testament books. And then he has a list of New Testament books. Notice, you see most of the, that corpus of Paul's letters there. Um, debates these letters. But look what we have here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have four Gospels mentioned. And that's 253 A.D. Okay? Now you don't see any, like I say, in none of these conversations do we hear... Uh, talk about some of these new Gospels we found. Most of the books, what you're going to see, most of what's in your New Testament was never debated, very early on was accepted as the bottom line. Yes, there were disputes about some different books. Let's look at Eusebius here. Eusebius is somebody that a lot of people discount because he was writing the official church history after Constantine became a Christian. And everybody debates about, did he really become a Christian or not? Yeah. I think it's pretty clear that he did, even though he didn't get baptized until he was still on his deathbed. Uh, he didn't quite understand baptism. But, but nonetheless, Constantine doesn't actually say Christianity is the religion of the state. No, he just says, knock yourselves out. We're not going to persecute you. And yes, the government does start to support the building of churches and and whatnot, but he never says every person in Rome will be a Christian now. That's, that's a misnomer, misnomer too. But Eusebius is a church history and working during that time, and he writes about a lot of the apostolic fathers. Although these lists I'm talking about, these are actual their writings that we have in various manuscripts and, um, and, and whatnot. So, so he lists these books, and he says these were settled. He says these were argued about. James, Jude, Peter, 2 John, 3 John, Revelation. Some of them were argued about because they didn't think they were maybe, you know, from the hand of the apostle. Some of them were argued about because of content. Most of these not so much about content, but about were they authentically from the apostle. I think there was questions about Revelation and its content and James as well. Some folks thought James was purely a Jewish book that maybe... But, but anyway, so um, if Luther wrote his canon, James and Revelation probably wouldn't have been in there. But, but, but he didn't, and he said, hey, I don't get to do that. They're in there. We have to deal with them, even though he wasn't, they weren't his favorite books. Do you have a favorite book in the Bible? I do. It's the Gospel of John and the Book of Romans and Galatians. Those are my favorites. I don't get rid of the rest, but those are, those are my favorites. So, so these are some of the books that were debated about um, that Eusebius tells us about. Okay? Let's see. When we get finally to the Council of Carthage, which happens in 397, they come up with the set New Testament and Old Testament for Christians. And you'll see that in the Old Testament there are some of those apocryphal books that are not in your Protestant Old Testament. Yours ends with uh, you know, the, the, the last prophet. But they, they included, because they went off of the Greek Bible, a lot of these apocryphal books. But notice the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. You've got the 11 letters of Paul. You've got the letters of Peter, the three letters of John, James, Jude, and Revelation. Basically, that happens about 397. Now, so what do you conclude from all of this? Do you conclude that people at the Council of Carthage had these thousands of books to choose from and said, oh, we're going to get these? Or do you conclude the canon was basically set and all they did was ratify it? I think that's the historically accurate description of what happened. Just for the same reason that you guys said at the beginning of class, you said you got to have a standard. You know? I mean, we've got... It's hard enough to know what the faith is just by looking at these books. If we had all these other writings, you know, and they did exclude some because of content. 
So, for all those reasons, the church came together and they said, this is our canon. Now, did they suppress other books and say you shouldn't read them, get rid of them? Absolutely. They, this, the political crack and the, you know, let's hear all sides that we're in a different world than they were. Um, and so they felt a lot of these books were perverting the truth, so they said certainly they shouldn't be kept or read. Um, although some of them certainly probably did continue on. So, so that's a, this is a wonderful tool to look at these various folks and, and look at the development. Now, a couple other really fun things that I want to put before you. There is a guy named Marcion who was declared by the church a heretic, and he's pretty early, I want to say, gosh, I'm not a historian, so I'm forgetting my dates, but like 150s AD. Um, and he, see if this sounds familiar, he didn't like the, the Greek Bible that, had come, that was around because he felt, as he read the Old Testament, that that was a different God than the New Testament. I have a lot of you come to me as Marcionites, and you say, oh, I like the New Testament. I don't like the Old Testament. The God there is different than the New Testament. That's what Marcion thought. Because, you know, there is some wrath of God going on in the Old Testament. I mean, you have to kind of forget about all the, the grace of God in the Old Testament. You know, all the songs, surely his goodness and mercy calls me all the days of my life. You know, I mean, you have to kind of just have tunnel vision and just see one thing. But Marcion believed that there were two gods. Not one god. There were two gods. And he also believed that Jesus, um, he was kind of a Gnostic, that Jesus was not really human, he was only spiritual. <coughs> so what did not, what, and the reason Marcion said this is, is, what he said is that Jesus actually gave some secret special knowledge that nobody else knew about to somebody else, and then somebody else gave that to who? Marcion. <laughs> now, does that sound familiar? <laughs> uh, not, not to belittle our, our, our Latter-day Saints folks, but that's what they believe happened. Jesus came over to America, gave the secret knowledge to the Indian tribe, which we had never found any archaeological evidence of. But, and then they wrote it... Uh, they, uh, an angel, they wrote it down, and an angel gave Joseph Smith the ability to translate it, and he carries these big, huge tablets of gold out of the wilderness, the Book of Mormon. I don't know how he could have carried the, the gold, but the big tablets of gold. But anyway, that's the story of the Latter-day Saint Church. Well, Marcion kind of had a similar diet thing going on. He had authority because, hey, Jesus gave me the secret knowledge. Always be careful when somebody's talking about secret knowledge. Christianity is not a secret knowledge. Nothing about it, secret. It's all out there in the book. So, but Marcion rewrote, the reason I tell you about him is he wrote, he rewrote his own, own Bible. He did like Thomas Jefferson. Tom, what did Thomas Jefferson do? He got rid of all the miracles, and he just kept the kind of laws that he liked. Well, Marcion did the same thing. He liked Paul because he saw in Paul, you know, Paul says bad stuff about the law, the law, and then gospel. So he liked Paul. He was going to keep a lot of Paul, but he got, he, he wrote his own gospel, took the Gospel of Luke and kind of wrote it himself. And the church said no. So I tell you about Marcion to let you know there was already a standard of which Marcion disagreed with. You get that? At 150 A.D. Or somewhere. Don't quote me on the internet or whatever. Um, so a guy comes along named Arrhenius. Arrhenius, not Arrhenius. Arrhenius. And he kind of pulls the church back, and guess what he does? He goes to the biblical books that are in your New Testament to refute Marcion. So already we can see, if there wasn't a set canon, there was a set group of books that were the judge, the measuring stick. Does that make sense? Okay? I think that's interesting. Um, Alright, let's see where we go next. Now, we, in the last 200 years, have been given a gift by God. We have found whole books of the Bible in Greek that date back before the Council of Carthage. Okay, Council of Carthage 400. These codices date to the mid 4th century, that's 350-ish AD. One, I, I, I don't remember 
remember the exact date, but it's been found in recent history. It was found in a little monastery below one of the sites for Mount Sinai. So they call it um, Codex um, Sinai. Try and say it. Sinaiticus. So that's why they call it that, um, because that's where they found it. It's an entire, beautifully written on animal vellum, animal skin, entire book of the Old and New Testament, including the Apocrypha, because it's in Greek, uh, it's 350 or so, before the church actually said, these are the books. What does that tell you? It tells me that the canon was set, really, in all, for all intents and purposes, before they officially said, these are the books. All right? But wouldn't you like to page through this? I'd love to take a look at this. And I told you we would. So, <laughs> I better pull it off. got to be there, or maybe it doesn't. Oh, okay, let's do it this way. Sorry, I think I've got the link embedded, so I had it called up, but it must have went away, so let's see, we can do it. Oh, there it is. Yeah, let's see if we can, let's see if it'll get us there. It might take a minute to load. So there's another one called Codex Vaticanus, because it's housed at the Vatican, but it's the same thing. It's an entire um, Bible, Greek Old Testament and New Testament, and it basically has what we have come to understand as our canon. So let's go way over here. So this is what it looks like. Let me see if I can make it a little bigger. You can, and this is from the British Museum. So let's turn some pages here. Um, it was found in book form. I didn't finish the story. They were cleaning up. Remember how we read last week how they were cleaning the temple and they found the book of the law? They had lost it? Well, um, they were looking for um, something in particular in this old monastery, and they found it completely deserted. And so when Luther, and Luther, Luther didn't have this Bible. He had other manuscripts that were younger than, than this one. The, the, the uh, King James Bible was not, these manuscripts were not used to, to translate that particular Bible. Um, I wanted to try and show you there. So here's a good example of how they did it. You'll see there's no spaces between words. No, there are markings for paragraphs. So there is some, there's no verses, but there's some markings for paragraphs here. And so... They found, by looking really closely at these manuscripts, that they put little dots in the bottom, and then they, they must have uh, maybe put little pins, top and bottom, and ran a little string, and that way the scribe could know the, the border of it. And so this is, this is the way they wrote. And it's all in capitals, as you can probably see. So no punctuation, no spaces between words, all capitals. And so sometimes that makes translating interesting. So, so look, so you can page through. Some of the pages are a little more. And then actually, so I, I tell you I could read the Greek exactly, but you can mark on here and it'll tell you exactly what you're looking at. This is Mark 9, so the Gospel of Mark, etc. Okay? Now before these, and of course this class isn't on textual criticism, but before these main fully put together books of the Bible, we've got hundreds of papyrus manuscripts, not, no, pieces of papyrus and yes, manuscripts that go back way before this. And then, so the biblical scholars compare these, these codices with all those papyri and they come together and bring you your English translation. That's kind of how that works. Pretty cool? Pretty cool. So, um, this is the Vaticanus. So now I want to stop and give you some time to say, okay, what's my takeaway? What do I, what, what stuck <laughs> today? Um, I want you to spend, oh my goodness, we're, spend two or three minutes talking amongst your row or your, uh, your table about what's your takeaway. 
And then if you don't get to everybody, we're going to do five minutes as a big group, too. So about three, four minutes, just a little popcorn. What's your takeaway? What did you get? What questions remain? Have at We can always pick up some things next week. Like if you have questions that still remain. One real quick question. They, somebody asked, how did they date these um, these books? And, and also somebody asked, is this just a list of books? No, this is the entire Bible. The Codex Vaticanus and the Codex um, Sinaiticus, those are all huge books. And they have the whole of your Bible in there. So they date these both. I think they do some carbon dating type of stuff. But primarily the way they date them is they know from looking at all kinds of other literature, Greek literature of every time period, stylistically, the way they did the script changed. And, and actually after this, in Greek they start to use capitals and, and uh, lowercase. And so the, when they see that they're only using uppercase, that's a certain time period. That's why they date them. That's another way they date them. So, okay, so takeaways. What are your takeaways? Anybody want to share? Large group? Please, right there. If there's a new and compelling find, how does it get considered? Um, there are... <laughs> yeah, Kevin, all right. <laughs> all right, so what, what I have to explain to you is that there are different Greek New Testaments, like I have one, there's a d different versions and stuff. So those are... But everywhere where a manuscript, a new manuscript's been found, or there's a disagreement of the authorities, they would call them, that it puts it in the bottom. It puts notes. It says, Papyrus 46 says this. Papyrus 51 says this. So every disagreement I've got in my Greek New Testament. If there was a new one found today, they'd have to start looking at, you know, whether it affects the... The different versions, the Greek New Testaments that then the scholars use. So they would eventually incorporate it in if, if it was proven to be, you know, yeah, yeah, great question. What are your other takeaways? Who did the book binding? No, I, I don't know. So a monk, it was found in a monastery, so and you, I, mean, I think that would be clear. We don't know who, but they took meticulous care about these things. So, yeah. Please, Sue. There are, there are some who will say that there are little additions that, that um, different monks might have added when they were making copies. Yes. Uh, how, how do we handle those? So, um, let me see if I can find a page here that has some... Here's some editing where, they, where someone... Oh, we're going too far. Um, I'll see if I can find a page where you can see that there was either an error or some um, where they, they kind of wrote in some things additionally. It, some people think that the original didn't have some of the chapter marks. Um, so, so the question would be how do we deal with any changes the scribe might have made? Usually when they do that, they're struggling with another, that another manuscript says this and this one says this, and so they try and make a, a little correction or addition, or, or try and, if the grammar is totally confused, they try and clear it up. Those are the ones that I think of. What, I, what I've seen, of course I'm somewhat biased on this, but that there are no major doctrinal content issues. Um, yes, there are some fine points and, and interesting things, but, but I know some people would say, well, that's been so tampered with, you know, over years that we have no confidence that what we have is a... I think that would be a way overstatement, way overstatement, yeah. Yeah. I, I especially can say that about the way the Hebrew Bible was done, because we've got our oldest manuscript of the Hebrew Old Testament is like 1200s, I want to say, A.D., and then we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. So now we have a 1,200 year or 1,000 year comparison. And when we look at them, we go, wow, you almost could press a Xerox machine. I mean, it's, 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 I'm not saying there aren't errors and things, but content-wise, it's been amazingly well, well passed on. So 
Um, I think that would be true of the New Testament. Now for us, see, we've got a benefit. We've got all the papyrus and all these things, and we can compare them all. And then we, you have your English Bible, and sometimes in your English Bible, it will say some authorities read, like one that came up. The Gospel of Mark has two, you know, it, what is it, chapter, I forget the chapter now, six, six it, it just ends. The women run away afraid, and that's the end in the in most ancient manuscripts. i got to find out if what the um, uh, Sinaiticus Sin, Sin, um, Codex has, I forget. I don't think it has the fuller ending, and that's why, and that's why in most of your Bibles, it'll either put the long ending of the Gospel of Mark in a and palace, because the more ancient authorities don't have it. So that's where somebody later on, Sue, it's a great question, said, that doesn't make sense to just end it with the women running away afraid. And so, if you look at it, it's really a combo of, of Matthew and Luke that they kind of took together and wrote an ending to make it make sense. But the older manuscripts that we found don't have it, so in your English Bible, it's going to be noted that way. I don't know about the Okay, I know we're running out. Any more takeaways? Yes, please, Stephanie. You talked about how, especially some of the young people, when they find out that there was no parachute growth, yes. <laughs> that, that that kind of blows everything up right. them. And I would hope that if they hear what you told us, that they would feel much more grounded and strong and right. be able to believe because it, it just makes so much sense. It feels really solid. Yeah, good. That's a great takeaway. And I would hope that all of you would take that away. It's hard to walk the narrow path, but I would hope these, talk, these conversations about the canon will help you have confidence in, in your Bible, but yet also be able to look at it critically, like the book of Revelation. That was one of the ones they talked about. You know, I would have liked if they have left it out. <laughs> but that's Philip Bradford, you know? Lightning bolt. But, but no, so we have to wrestle with it. But it's also important, you know, to be able to come at it that way. Okay, so next week, I'm really doing a theme here with history. I think we're on ancient inscriptions. Did you know that there are inscriptions and things we've found that confirm the existence of some of the things that the Bible talks about, the people that, the people that are mentioned? And we're going to just have fun and look at all those. So if you love archaeology, don't miss next week. All right? Go and peace, serve the Lord. Thanks for your time.